A week ago, I released my really tiny RISC-V emulator. It was just complicated enough to run Linux, and it's gotten a lot of traction. People like Joshua Ashton have used it as a template for writing their own minimal RISC-V emulators. Many people have been asking me, can your emulator run Doom? And after some tinkering, I found out that in its original state, no. Doom needs to write to a graphics output device, which my emulator as it stands doesn't have. And as it turned out, there was even a bug lurking deep in my emulator that Doom hit. Once all of that was resolved, though, it turned out that Doom could indeed work. Six years ago, I started working on Embedded Doom, or MDoom, where my goal was to make a truly embedded port of Doom, one that was extremely simple with everything compiled in, and one that could run on RAM-constrained systems. And to that effect, I mostly succeeded, as it should be able to run on systems with less than 512 kilobytes of RAM. Maybe someday I'll make a deep dive video and some of the cooler parts of Doom that I found when I was porting this six years ago. For now though, I'm interested in porting this to run on my RISC-V emulator. The most interesting blockers were that I wanted a way to accept input and a way to output the video from the game without making my emulator any more sophisticated. Thankfully, the user input and video driver for Doom are all located in iVideo.c. This file contains the I.O. for the game, so I can put all of my code specific to this platform there. For keyboard input, I reuse code that I wrote for the emulator, and I started to work on a way to do character video output instead of graphical output. One annoyance is that all of the content for Doom revolves around a 320 by 200 pixel screen, and I'm not about to recreate all of that content, uh, though it would be appreciated if you did to make it possible to render out a lower resolution. But we can just ignore 7 eighths of the pixels and sample out 160 by 50 of them. We can use ANSI codes to send a foreground, text, and background color. If a pixel is really bright, we can use that as the foreground color, just like an LSB, and the background color, like an MSB. We're then able to use the ANSI codes to set the cursor's position to the top left of the screen and begin scanning through the pixels. If a character's foreground or background color is different than the previously outputted one, we can use the ANSI codes to change the color of that pixel. If the color is the same, we can just print a character. For those not in the know, ANSI or VT100 codes are sequences of characters that you can print and they'll tell the terminal to do things like set the cursor position, set or disable bold, foreground or background color, or even make the terminal go, while the origin of escape codes have been debated, arguably back to the 1870s with Badeau codes, the syntax that we use today was formalized in 1975 with the VT100. Windows dragged its feet until 2016 when they finally made ANSI codes a first-class citizen in Windows command line apps. You can switch to ANSI escape mode in Windows with the command system double quote double quote which works in all console applications, even Python. I actually prototyped this video output and player input module on my regular desktop Linux system in a regular terminal before going to the RISC-V version. If we wanted to use the emulated Linux terminal output in the kernel, this would be painfully slow. But there's nothing stopping us from just writing to the hard-coded address 10 million hex to output our codes. And considering that we're going to be outputting 8 kilo characters plus color updates for around 40 kilobytes per frame, it matters that we go fast. Before I could start trying to run this in my emulator, I was stopped by bugs that were introduced when I tried to further optimize Doom, notably by removing the network code and making it possible to change player count. Part of that was that I wanted to change the number of max players from four to max players, so that allocated arrays could be smaller. I knew some of the places that that needed to be updated, and so I fixed the code, but I didn't realize that there were more. On my desktop, it seemed like everything should work fine, but the cracks started to appear. I started seeing some things that shouldn't be possible happening. I got the hint that it was memory corruption of some kind because I printed everywhere that a specific value was able to be updated, but somehow its value was still changing. So it had to be other code writing to this variable in RAM. I wanted to talk about several techniques I typically use when debugging these weird problems. First, I used a map file to see a map of everything in RAM. I found the variable that was inexplicably being changed, and I could see that right before it, there was an array, player in game. Hmm. It wouldn't be that hard to search the code for all the cases where player in game was modified. But let's keep going. Next, I would normally use Valgrind, which is great for memory leaks and finding uninitialized variables or access faults. But because Doom only compiles to 32-bit, Valgrind was a dead end. Next up, libason, or the address sanitizer. By compiling with dash f sanitize equals address and dash static libason, GCC emits a lot more code to make sure that everything we're doing is kosher. 
Running Libase on actually did discover a bug, which I quickly patched, and for some other reason it didn't identify this bug, but only some of the side effects that were caused because of it. To complete the quartet of debugging, I opened up GDB and made a memory change breakpoint on the variable that was being corrupted and ran the program. The first time the breakpoint was hit, it was because the variable was actually being changed. But the next time the breakpoint was hit, it had nothing to do with the variable that I was watching. I had nabbed the buffer flow in the act. Thanks to a little bit of elbow grease and two quick bug fixes, I saved a couple of bytes of RAM and everything worked. It was now time to run mdoom on my RISC-V emulator. If I use the system target for the flat file image, we can just use the same compile flags as we used for Hello Linux, and mdoom just gloms everything together into a single binary image, and much to my surprise, it ran on the first try. Well, until I tried to start the game. Some people think no MMU means no memory protection at all, and quite the contrary. Most memory access violations are to addresses below 10 million hex or above F0 million hex. We can catch those. In spite of our emulator being the size of a walnut, we can do the proper thing and percolate traps back up to the Linux kernel running inside the VM. This also works for other types of traps, like invalid opcodes, e-break, unaligned accesses, and the like. The emulated kernel can properly handle printing the core dump and crashing the program in the virtualized environment, and printing this mildly helpful message to our kernel log. Anyway, we did get an access violation. Was it the WFI? Was it the weird to-do about not knowing the privilege level for traps? Maybe not enough stack? No, no, and no. One of the optimizations I made was to turn off the extra checks that Doom can do. Turning on range check showed that this was an assert that ought not be hit. As I tracked down the problem, eventually I found a call to fix mall, and it looked like that function was misbehaving. Yeah, this makes me cringe because of a separate bug having to do with 64-bit math that I never got to the bottom of. So, let's roll up our sleeves, it's time to find and fix this bug. Let's do our OBJ dump trick again and get the assembly. Mol H, that's a very rare instruction to see. It's used when multiplying two 32-bit numbers to get the most significant 32 bits of the result and discard the bottom 32 bits when multiplying those numbers. But it's supposed to operate on sign numbers. I had to debug the input and output of each assembly instruction before I was finally able to identify the problem. Do you see it? Registers are always stored as 32-bit unsigned numbers. When we convert this to a 64-bit int, GCC doesn't know to do the sign extension, and instead of multiplying by negative 5, for instance, we're now multiplying by 4,294,967,291. Interestingly, because math, this is only an issue when using negative numbers, and specifically the molh command. If we typecast first to an int32, no actual operations are happening, but GCC knows that we should be multiplying by a sign number. After a two and a half hour debugging session, pulling my hair out, three lines of code changed and everything was just mmm. -hmm. We're only getting around 25 FPS, mostly because we're still using the text terminal to output on. Perf details can also be addressed at a later time. The point is, from here on out, whenever anyone asks if my tiny RISC-V emulator runs Doom, I can finally say yes. Even if pressing back causes the player to launch forward as if fired out of a cannon for some reason.